Good evening, everybody. Thank you for, uh, once again for joining us uh, at another one of the Astral Aviation Workshops. This is our second workshop this year, second weather workshop rather, and um, again brought to you by Astral Aviation Consulting uh, Limited on behalf of the UK Civil Aviation Authority. As ever, we have a interesting and varied panel with us this evening. My name is Chris Kidd. I'm the Director of Astro Aviation Consulting. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with us, uh, we are an independent aviation consulting uh, organisation that are undertaking a bespoke uh, programme uh, to provide you with safety resources uh, through the Civil Aviation Authority. So if you want to stay in involved and you want to stay in the loop as to what's going on, in all things to do with safety in general aviation, then please do sign up to our website, uh, www.astralaviationconsulting.com, where you can get on our mailing list. You can also follow us on all the socials as per normal. I'm delighted to be once again joined this evening by uh, Matt Lane, who's the head of training for RES Sports Aircraft and an active and single, eng single engine and multi engine FI and flight examiner. Good evening, I'm also, hi, all. hi, Matt. I'm also joined uh, once again by Dr. Simon Keeling. Evening, all. Simon, Simon is a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society, a one-time TV weather presenter, and the founder of Weather School. Weather School teaches pilots how to confidently interpret and forecast the weather so they can improve their flight safety and get the maximum from their flying time available. You can find out more about the courses that Simon run at weatherschool.co.uk. And then finally, this evening, I'm joined by Joe Aston. Hello, Joe. Hi. Hi. Uh, Joe is a CAA te Met Technical Officer and a qualified aeronautical meteorological forecaster for the Met Office with 15 years experience. She spent 10 years in defence at various UK's and overseas locations and a further five years in civil forecasting at Heathrow, both on the forecast bench and as the manager. So what these two don't know about weather <laughs> isn't worth knowing, I'm assured. OK, over the course of the next hour and a half, we're going to break the workshop down into a few different sections as we often do. Uh, in section one, Joe's going to cover clouds and cloud types. In section two, Simon will then discuss air masses and fronts. Section three, Matt will look at the so what. So what does this mean to you? So we've talked about the weather. So what does that actually mean to you when you get airborne or making that decision to go or no go? And then section four, uh, Matt's then going to continue, uh, but he's going to do a little quiz. Uh, so that'll be interesting uh, to test your knowledge. And then finally, uh, as ever, we'll pick up some Q&A at the end. This is an interactive workshop, so I really do want you all to get involved. I can see some people pops up in some stuff in the chat box already, so please continue to do that. We'd love to hear your experiences, share your thoughts and ideas in that. Uh, additionally, if you do have questions, um, then please do put them in the Q&A function. So use the Q&A function and then we'll endeavour to get through as many of those as we can at the end. However, before we start, <laughs> got a little treat. We are going to run a little, little competition this evening. So we've done it before. Um, and Simon's kindly decided to um, offer us another course, another online course, as you can see there, worth £250. So to re we want to reach as many people as possible with all of our workshops and other safety related information, which is why we're really keen that we get as many as you we as we can on our mailing list, which I mentioned already, and on social media to make it really easy to send you this information about forthcoming workshops and other safety resources without you having to go and find it for yourself. So to make sure you don't miss anything, please do uh, follow us on the socials. So what do you need to do to be in it to win it tonight? One lucky attendee tonight will win a weather school course with £250, courtesy of Astral Aviation Consulting with Simon Keeling's weather school. It's a voucher of a three hour aviation weather school online course, which can be redeemed at a time of your choosing. It's suitable for all from, from pre-PPL right up to ATPL. So if you'd like to be in with a chance of winning that, you must follow us on Facebook, please, and Instagram. Links to both are on the screen. And you must do this within the next 15 minutes. Let us know in the chat box when you've done that. We obviously will be checking and we'll let the, let the happy winner know at the end. Okay, so that's enough from me. Let's start talking about clouds, shall we? Joe, over to you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris, and thank you very much to both um, Chris and Matt for inviting me along tonight. Um, so let's kick off and uh, let's start with a quick poll. Um, so first question, hopefully straightforward, we'll see what comes back. Uh, what are the characteristics and the effects of a cumulonimbus cloud? Is it A, towering cloud, anvil-shaped top associated with severe turbulence, severe icing, lightning and wind shear? 
B, a flat cloud associated with poor visibility and light winds. C, towering cauliflower shaped cloud associated with mild downdrafts and heavy rain. Or D, a flat cloud associated with light rain and drizzle. I'll give you a few seconds to have a think about that and pop in an answer. Ah, oh, look at that. Fantastic. <laughs> so the correct answer was A. So it's a towering cloud with anvil shaped top associated with severe turbulence, severe icing, lightning and wind shear. So that's pretty good. Going. 86 percent of you managed to get that one right. So that's great. Um, but let's carry on and um, let's talk about those clouds. And um, we're going to start off with looking at how and why clouds form. So the range of ways in which clouds can form um, is a variable nature of the atmosphere it also results in, you know, an enormous variety of shapes and size as, and textures of clouds. Um, and as you're probably aware, the air contains water vapour and clouds form when that air rises and cools um, and the cold air can't hold as much water vapour as warm air. So as the air cools, it becomes saturated and the water vapour in it condenses. This water vapour then collides with and sticks to tiny little particles floating in the air, um, such as salt or dust. And as the air continues to rise and cool, more and more water vapour continues to cling to these particles. Eventually, you reach a point where enough water vapour condenses around the particles to form a cloud droplet. And it's the water that makes the cloud visible to us. Um, and these drops are so small, they just stay suspended in the air. But sometimes they combine to become larger droplets or crystals. And if they become large enough and heavy enough, then they will eventually fall from the sky. And that's where we see our precipitation. So what causes the air to rise um, and start that kind of cooling process? Okay, so um, there's five mechanisms, there's kind of three primary uh, mechanisms for cloud formation. So the first one is the sun, um, seems pretty obvious, the sun heats the ground, then heats the air just above it, and that causes it to rise upwards in the sky because warm air rises, and this tends to produce cumulus clouds um, um, and is known as convection. So number two is hills and mountains, and that's when warm air is travelling towards a mountain or a hill. It, it can't go into the hill, it, that acts as a barrier, and so it rises upwards along the terrain. Stratus clouds often produce this way, um, and that's known as orographic uplift. And then number three is a weather front. So a weather front um, is where warm and cold air meet. And I know Simon's going to be talking a little bit more about this later on, so I'm not going to say too much on this topic. Um, but that produces a variety of different cloud types, and it depends on the type of front and the properties of air as well. So as I said, those are the three main mechanisms of cloud formation. However, there's a couple more as well um, that, also, that are relevant. Um, one of these is convergence. Um, so that's where streams of air are flowing towards each other from different directions. And then as they meet, they're forced to rise. They can't go into the ground. The ground acts as a barrier, so they go upwards. Um, that can cause cumulus clouds and showery conditions. Um, a really good example of that would be uh, perhaps a sea breeze during the summer. Um, and things to look out for would be a trough line, which is that solid black line that you quite often see on a weather chart. And then number five, finally, is turbulence. Um, I'm not going to say too much on this one. We could probably do a whole dedicated session <laughs> just on turbulence, but essentially it can play a part in cloud formation, but not it isn't the sole mechanism. Um, an example would be perhaps um, the way that fog is formed or a, a mountain wave cloud um, as well. So that's um, what causes the air to rise. And then as, we, as it rises, we're now going to have a look at the height of the clouds. Um, so water vapour condenses as the saturated air rises, but you know why do they form at different heights? Um, and effectively, the height of the cloud formation depends on the properties of the air. So the temperature that it's at um, and how saturated it is um, to start with. And those clouds are then categorised by the height of their formation, so into low, medium and high, according to the part of the atmosphere in which they're usually found. And so on your screen, you can see um, what that looks like, um, the cloud classification, um, and there's a really good Met Office um, cloud types and pronunciations and the heights. Um, you can see it just there on the right of the screen, but that's, um, that's available to download on the Met Office site as well, so it's quite a useful thing to have. OK, so cloud types that you need to know about. Uh, we've talked about how clouds will form and why they form at different heights. But what is it that you really need to know about? 
So from a GA perspective, we'd suggest that probably the main cloud types that you need to be aware of are the low clouds that can affect your on route navigation. So your takeoff, your landing, um, and remembering that you know VFR flight below 3000 feet should be clear of cloud in sight of the surface um, when flying less than 140 knots. And therefore, clouds that get in the way of this can cause a problem for pilots. Um, if they end up below the cloud base, the 1500 foot AGL, or perhaps trapped above a cloud layer, having lost sight of the surface, and then there's no apparent way down. So let's have a quick look at the three main low level cloud types that might get you in trouble. And we'll start off with the first one, which is stratus. So that's a term that's used to describe quite featureless clouds of low altitude. Um, they vary in colour from dark grey to almost white, and they can have tops up to around 12,000 12, foot AGL. Um, these clouds are formed in quite calm, stable conditions uh, when moist air moves over a cold land or sea surface, and they might produce a light drizzle. And actually in the winter can also produce snow as well. Um, quite a common example in the UK would be warm moist air coming in from the Atlantic, it's forced to rise through orographic uplift over the southwest peninsula of Cornwall and Devon, and that produces lots of really low cloud and drizzle. Um, so we know this, this is sometimes called as um, upslope stratus, um, it can be really localised, it's not very easily represented on charts. Um, Bristol Airport is somewhere that's really well known for that, you know, moist air coming up the Bristol Channel, it's lifted up over the hill to the airport, cools off, condenses into low clouds, hill fog, suddenly Bristol's fogged out. Um, so stratus can form from lifted fog as well, um, but that generally clears um, quite quickly in the spring, but can linger in autumn and winter as well. Um, and stratus is shown on a chart by the letters ST. Um, I'm just going to do a really brief mention at this point as well of something called nimbostratus, which is not always a particularly well-known cloud. Um, and I know, um, as we said earlier, you know, Simon's going to talk about front short, shortly, but um, it's quite common along a warm or occluded front. It's a very dense featureless cloud with bases from around 2000 foot AGL. Um, it's usually thick enough to block out the sun and bring persistent rain with it. Um, often, normally with clouds there's gaps at height between different types of cloud but with nimbostratus that is not normally the case it's one big thick layer through the atmosphere um, and it can bring a risk of severe icing as well so it's definitely one to kind of be aware of um, if you see it on a chart it'd be represented by the letters ns Okay, so next cloud is cumulus, probably the most recognisable cloud type. Um, they're usually individual cauliflower shaped clouds, they develop in fair weather conditions, um, and they're associated with what's known as an unstable environment. So this means that given the right conditions, there's nothing to hinder their vertical development. Uh, they're usually formed by convection with bases uh, around, well, from as low as 12,000 feet um, AGL. Uh, when these are well developed, um, these can sometimes give showers and in the winter over, um, snow as well um, and overland they usually disperse in the late afternoon or early evening when you effectively lose the heating from the sun. Um, aircraft entering into a cumulus cloud, um, you would expect to see at least moderate turbulence and icing with that. Um, and beneath the clouds as well, actually, you can also uh, experience turbulence associated with downdrafts and wind shear um, from cumulus clouds. Um, so that those kind of phenomena of wind shear turbulence, um, that's particularly likely to be encountered in and around something called a towering cumulus, um, which is effectively a, a kind of mature cumulus cloud. Um, and the severity of the turbulence and icing is very much dependent then on its instability. So it's often indicated by the size of the cloud and the outside air temperature. And a good rule of thumb with that is if the vertical extent of your cloud is more than its horizontal base, uh, then it's a towering cumulus. Um, so the pictures that you've probably got on your screen at the moment, um, the one on the far left, um, you can see it's quite a tall cloud um, and that would be a towering cumulus and the other ones would be just normal cumulus. Um, and it's shown on the charts by the letters CU. And then finally, leading on for cumulus, we're into the king of clouds, the CB um, cumulonimbus cloud. Uh, I so do that... believe, Joe, that you actually mm. took these pictures, didn't you? I, I did, yeah, I did whilst on shift at Heathrow. <laughs> so um, 
these are really heavy, dense clouds, a considerable vertical extent. They form a big mountain or huge tower in mature clouds. It often has that big, distinctive flat anvil shape, which you can see in the second picture with Heathrow Tower in the forefront there um, as well. It's often associated with really heavy precipitation. You can get hail, lightning, thunder, um, and bases can be down around 1,000 foot AGL. So with the cumulonimbus, the interaction between the sort of strong updrafts and the downdrafts within it, um, they can cause wind shear, severe turbulence within the cloud, as well as severe icing um, and really strong surface winds as well, which can be quite variable in direction and strength. Um, and they're quite common at surface level in the vicinity of a CB. Um, and that could be particularly hazardous to aircraft on takeoff or landing. Um, and in severe cases, you can get microbursts and funnel clouds and things like that. Um, so aircraft flying in the vicinity of a CB, um, you may also experience electrical disturbances, um, which can affect communications, navigation systems. And although that phenomenon, which is known as St. Elmo's fire, it's not necessarily a threat to safe flight. It is an indication of um, a CB uh, you know, nearby, so certainly worth paying attention to. Um, uh, generally, aircraft in the vicinity of a CB are at risk of being hit by lightning or hail, um, either of which can cause quite significant structural damage to aircraft. So as well as all those hazards mentioned, <laughs> there's also precipitation. Um, so snow, sleet, rain, um, that can contaminate an airfield or a runway surface, even temporarily, and that can create a hazard as well for takeoff and landing. So um, as you've probably figured from all of that, <laughs> flight into a CB is highly dangerous. And really the only defense against those hazards is to avoid flying into one in the first place. Because of that, a risk of CB will always be mentioned um, in the forecast charts, so the F215, the gamut, and in the TAFs or METARs. Um, and it's always assumed, if you see it on a chart, it is assumed that severe icing and turbulence is within that as well. So key things to bear in mind when planning, um, particularly in the summer months, sea breezes can cause areas of convection. So keep an eye out for those trough lines on the charts. Um, these usually indicate an area of quite strong organised convection. Um, and it's also worth mentioning winter CB. So this time of year, it really doesn't take um, much heating um, to kind of generate a CB. And um, although they have much smaller vertical extent, that the hazards are, are still the same as within a, a summer CB. Um, and we get exciting things like thunder snow, which I think there was potentially a report of this week somewhere down in the southwest, I think. Um, OK, so that's a, a quick run through of clouds forming and what to look for and the ones to avoid. And um, I'm going to hand over to Simon now, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about um, the clouds and the air masses and the fronts. Over to you, Simon. OK, thanks, Joe. I, I just want to ask you, are all of your holiday snaps similar to mine in that they're actually of clouds and very few of the places that you've gone? Quite a few, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. It's not just me. Um, OK, oh then. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, let's uh, get your brains working then. Some really interesting information there for, from Joe to set the scene. But but let's get the old grey matter firing away even more. And um, I think we'll start with a quick poll. So let's ask you a question. Here we go. So what I want to know is a front marks the boundary between low and high pressure systems shows us the location of turbulence on form 215. It marks the boundary or transition zone between two air masses and has an important impact upon the weather, or it shows us where the best flying conditions are for that day. So select from A, B, C or D. Uh, tell us which one you think it is. Of course, it's an anonymous poll. So nobody's going to be laughing at you. Uh, and trust me, uh, I'm head of uh, of stupid answers. So come on, uh, have a guess. Is it A, B, C or D? Which one of those do you think a front actually is? 
Okay, let's have a look at the answers. There we go. So a um, few of you went for A, uh, nobody went for B, well done, uh, and nobody went for C. The vast majority of you went for C, which is exactly right, because a front actually marks the boundary or the transition zone between two air masses, uh, and it's got an important impact upon the weather. And that's all that a front is. You know, fronts can be incredibly confusing when we get into textbooks and things like that. But actually, all they're doing is showing us the separation between two air masses, and it just makes life easier uh, when we try to understand what the weather is going to do. Okay, then, um, I'm gonna come back to fronts in just a moment, but let's first of all, take a look at air masses. And there are uh, six main types of air masses that affect the British Isles. Now, again, air masses are one of these things that when we're doing our uh, PPR MET exams, you kind of trudge through, don't you? It's one of those things that you have to get through. And, uh, you know, I often ask pilots uh, after they've passed their, their exam, um, OK, tell me about air masses then. What do you understand? And actually very little is retained. But as pilots, if we can get a good understanding of air masses, then we can make a first guesstimate as to what the weather is going to be, what visibility is going to be like, what cloud base is going to be like, and what cloud tops are going to be like. So air masses are really key to helping us make that first guesstimate as to what the forecast may be and, and add value to things like Form 215, to the TAFs and to the gamuts as well. So there are six main types of air masses that affect the British Isles. And I know for many of you, this is gonna be brushing up. For others of you, this is gonna be new stuff. So these are phrases that I'm gonna, there are gonna be phrases that I'm gonna use that hopefully are familiar to some of you, but to others, they may be new. So you might wanna make a note of these. We classify air masses primarily by the area in which they're originating. Uh, and also then we talk about continental and maritime air masses. So the area in which they're originating, the name is, the clue is really in the name. So Arctic, where do you think that occurs? Yeah, from the Arctic. Um, and then we talk about whether they're continental or maritime air masses. So that depends on whether they originate over the land or over the sea. Obviously over the land, it's gonna be dry. Over the sea, the air mass is gonna be wet. That's as hard as this gets. And then we talk about the Arctic or the Antarctic, equatorial, tropical, polar uh, air masses, or depending on the particular region in which they form, what we call the source region. So air masses, like I say, incredibly useful for pilots. So get ready. This is your air masses heads up. So we're going to kick off, first of all, with the Arctic maritime air mass. Now I should say at this point that these are the air masses affecting the UK. Actually, the principles of air masses can be applied to any country in the world. Um, so that, that idea that I've just said about the sea bringing us moisture, anything off the sea is gonna bring us moisture, maritime air masses, anything that comes off the land, continental, it's gonna bring us dry air. These sort of principles can be applied wherever you are. But the ones we're going to talk about today are the air masses that affect the UK and Ireland. So, first of all, Arctic maritime air masses. Where does it uh, originate? Yeah, you've guessed it, up in the Arctic. And um, for pilots, this one is a, a wintertime air mass that comes from uh, the north. Now, we say wintertime because it's highly dependent on water temperatures in the Arctic and particularly on the Arctic uh, being frozen. So what we look for in an Arctic maritime air mass is generally a north and northeasterly wind. We look for heavy wintry showers and also low freezing levels. Now, as Joe mentioned, cumulonimbus clouds in the winter can, can get generated quite easily. And in an Arctic maritime air mass, very often we'll have cumulonimbus and, cumul and, and cumulus clouds embedded within that air mass. And also associated, obviously, because of that, with the heaviest showers. Now, I always think of an Arctic maritime as the air mass that brings lots of heavy snow showers to northern and eastern Scotland and down eastern coasts of England. But more western and southern areas of the country, very often in an Arctic maritime, can actually fare much better for flying. But it's a really chilly air mass. Then we get on to the polar maritime air mass. Now, this is the one that as a pilot, I always think of as the sunshine and showers air mass. It originates over the poles, so it's cold. And then it flows south over the uh, Atlantic Ocean between Scotland and Iceland. Now, of course, there we're on the eastern extension of the uh, North Atlantic drift. So we get warmer ocean uh, temperatures in that area. With colder air at higher levels, 
that combination of a warm ocean and cooler air at higher levels destabilizes the atmosphere. And that allows cumulus clouds to generate. And we can sometimes get the cumulus clouds going up into cumulonimbus clouds. So they will become quite uh, extensive. There'll be quite a depth to them. And when we get this air mass, we look for the heavier showers, usually around northern and western coasts and hills. By the time the showers have blown towards the east and the south, very often they've lost um, some of the vigour. They can still be heavy, um, but very often they've lost some of the, the impact that they once had across those northern and western parts. During the winter months, we need to watch for lowering freezing levels and for the showers turning wintry as well, particularly uh, over hills. So we need to be aware of that when we're flying in and around these things, that very often freezing levels can drop quite quickly as the showers arrive. But again, you can often see around the showers, so it's quite possible to fly in between. Then we get to the tropical maritime air mass. Now, this is the absolute so-and-so when we want to go flying. This is the air mass that originates at the tropics. It flows across the Atlantic and it picks up heaps of moisture. And that moisture arrives from the southwest into the British Isles. And imagine somebody holding a sponge over the top of us and then wringing it out. And basically that's what happens in a tropical maritime air mass. That warm, moist air brings cloud, it brings rain, it brings milder weather. It's usually associated with low pressure over the Atlantic. And this really is our nemesis cloud. It clags up much of the country, particularly western and southern coasts and hills. We've got hill fog, we've got low cloud, we've got stratus and we've got drizzle. Once you get inland, so once we're through kind of the Midlands, particularly eastern parts of England, eastern parts of Scotland, in the summer months particularly, we can find that this air mass has dried out quite a bit. And it's on those occasions when those areas can see cloud break, the sun come through and uh, it become quite warm. But generally we think of tropical maritime air as containing lots of low cloud. Now, typically, uh, tropical maritime air is between a warm front and a cold front. So that kind of wedge that you see between the warm front and the cold front, that is um, uh, tropical maritime air. So then uh, we get on to a tropical continental air mass. And this one's coming in from North Africa. This one's pretty good for us to fly in. It brings dry air because it's originated at the tropics where it may have had some moisture, but also warm air associated with it. It then flows northwards, very often across the land masses of North Africa, across Iberia, and then eventually uh, across France. So it's coming across continental Europe before it arrives in the British Isles. It's got rid of its moisture by then. And in the summer, this is the uh, air mass that brings us uh, heat waves. Now, very little cloud associated with it, but when we're flying, we need to think about turbulence that can be generated by the temperatures that can be caused by uh, the tropical continental air mass. So we just need to be aware of that air mass. It's good for flying, but it's one of those where when you look at it, you see clear blue skies. We've all done it, haven't we? Turned up at the, the airfield and thought this is going to be a cracking day. Then the temperature shoots up. Suddenly we're at 25 degrees. You take off. Your aircraft performance is down anyway, but then you go flying in it and suddenly you're bouncing all over the place. So just beware, good air mass for flying, but it can catch us out with those warm temperatures. Tropical, uh, and then where are we? We're on to a uh, returning polar maritime air mass. Now, this one is uh, where we have the granddaddy of all clouds being cumulonimbus. This is the grandmother of all air masses returning polar maritime, where we get air that flows south over the Atlantic, and then it comes back northwards, very often around an area of low pressure situated out towards the west of Ireland. It'll bring us heavy showers, it'll bring us unstable air, it will bring cumulus clouds, it will bring cumulonimbus clouds, it will throw just about everything at us. It mainly affects western and southern areas. So that's where uh, we get the heaviest of the showers. These can clump together into more persistent periods of precipitation as well. But once we get towards the east, we tend to find that most of the showers have faded away, um, although there can still be um, some pretty heavy showers around. But west and south are usually the ones to avoid 
in the uh, in the returning uh, tropical maritime air mass. And then uh, we've got the polar continental air mass, and this one comes in from the east. Remember uh, a few days ago, we saw a polar continental air mass for a while. So this is where the air has originated over the poles. It's then flowed over the continent. It's come back east across the continent and it's relatively dry because it's come across continental Europe. But of course, before it reaches the British Isles, it has to cross the North Sea. Now, I have an argument and this is going to be a forecaster's pub discussion. OK, this is me being a pedant that says in the British Isles, because we're surrounded by uh, ocean, can you ever really truly have a proper continental air mass? Mm, sometimes I'll argue the case and, and polar continental suggests this because the air has to flow across the North Sea to get here. So I'm going to propose a polar continental maritime air mass because it has to come across the sea. But officially for your exams, it's a polar continental air mass. And what it does is as it picks up uh, moisture coming in across the North Sea, it's already picked up quite a bit of pollution from northern parts of Europe. So those little nuclei of pollution, once those get across the North Sea, they encourage uh, condensation to take place and we can get low cloud formed along uh, eastern coasts of England. So very often in the polar continental air mass, A, it's chilly in the winter, but it can also bring us low cloud across these uh, eastern areas of the country. By the time you get towards the west, things have dried up, cloud bases will increase and very often the sun is coming through. So uh, a, a polar continental air mass from the east is one to watch for the development of low cloud perhaps out towards the east. And also worth mentioning with that easterly too, that um, very often we're on the southern sides of high pressure when we get that easterly. And sometimes you can get caught out when flying with the wind speeds on the southern edges of areas of high pressure. They can be sometimes a little bit higher than you'd first imagine by looking at the charts. So something just to be aware of there. So the trick with air masses really is just to keep yourself current with them, keep reading through about them, and you'll soon, um, you'll soon be able to get that knowledge to be able to make those first guesstimates as to what an air mass uh, is, uh, is. Now, one thing I wanna say as well is don't get hung up if you can't identify an air mass that's affecting the British Isles at any particular time. We as forecasters struggle with it on occasions because the air is constantly evolving, it's constantly being mixed up, and sometimes you can just be between air masses. So don't beat yourself up if you're unable to identify the air mass. Start easy, start with the obvious ones, and then you can try and adjust when a situation is a little more tricky. The easy ones really, tropical maritime, between a warm front and a cold front and um, the uh, polar maritime air that very often follows behind a cold front. Okay, so that's a bit about air masses for you. Um, what about fronts? So I just wanna to touch on fronts as well because fronts are another topic which can be made incredibly complex for pilots. And, I kind of put my hand up to this, that as a profession, we've kind of kept ourselves, you know, as masters of the dark arts sometimes, I think, and I haven't really explained this to pilots properly. So don't get hung up about fronts. To start with, and from a base level, as GA pilots, we really don't need to know that much more about fronts than it's an area of cloud and rain. Because let's face it, for the majority of us, we don't want to be flying through them, okay? They're gonna generally keep us on the ground. So fronts are areas of cloud and rain. However, what's of most use to a pilot is to get to know the clouds that are associated with each of the fronts and also where on the front you can expect to find the precipitation. So once you accept that a front is just an area of cloud and precipitation, you can build your knowledge on top of that. So, as we said in the poll, weather fronts actually mark the boundary of a transition zone between two air masses. They're entirely a construct of a forecaster's mind. OK, that's that's effectively what they are. They're just an aid to understanding what the weather is doing. And they're just a tool that shows the boundaries between those two air masses. So 
think about warm air and cold air. They don't really mix. They're like bad friends at a party. They'll kind of cast each other a glance, but they're not really going to get on. And that's why that boundary between the two air masses exists. It's no more complex than that. And across the front, there can be large variations in temperature. And generally speaking, the larger the variation in temperature is, the stronger the front tends to be. Now, of course, these are sort of empirical rules. You know, there are always um, cases where that, that, that's not true, but generally where uh, that stronger temperature gradient exists, so the front will be stronger. Other factors that affect the strength of the front include things such as change of dew point, and very often looking at dew point changes makes it easier to identify the front than temperature changes, and also looking at wind and pressure variations too. Now, I'm not particularly going to go into a lot of detail about those now because those are in, in the textbooks, um, but that's what we're looking for as forecasters when we're identifying fronts. Now, uh, uh, as I say, across the front, there can be large variations in temperature as warm air comes in contact with that colder air. The UK has unique weather because we're an island nation and with a, a large ocean to the west of us, a large landmass to the east of us and our position north of the equator makes us a unique area uh, for fronts. And that means that we experience a large number of frontal systems and, of course, the weather associated with them. So you can see on the charts that are available from the Met Office and from lots of other sources and on Form 215, those fronts are drawn on there. A professional meteorologist has sat there with all the knowledge that they have and have identified the fronts on those charts for you. And as I've explained to you before, these charts are an excellent way for you to be able to decide on whether your planned flight is likely to be within your personal limits before delving into more depth about the weather story that's likely to affect your planned flight. And when I'm planning a flight, when I'm looking to fly, the chart that I go to, first of all, without fail, is that frontal chart that's drawn up from the Met Office. I'll look at the analysis chart and I'll look at the forecast charts. And that tells me most of the information that I need to know about whether it's worth delving deeper into what the uh, into what the picture is going to be. So let's look at each of the fronts that will affect us when we are flying. And there are three fronts uh, that we need to know about. They are warm fronts, cold fronts and occluded fronts. Now you'll have seen these diagrams no doubt before or something very similar to them. This is the 3D slice through a front. Now, when we visualise a low pressure with fronts around it, the warm front tends to be the first front that we'll see. It's symbolised on a weather map as a line with semicircles. Um, warm fronts are often coloured red in the colour charts, or you'll see them as black semicircles um, on, the, on the black and white charts. But they are solid semicircles. Important to note that because sometimes you will see the semicircles as hollow semicircles. And that means that that warm front exists above the surface, but I'm not going to go into that at this stage. Warm fronts tend to bring rain followed by drizzle. And the first cloud ahead of a warm front is cirrus high wispy cloud. And that then thickens through cirrus stratus and into alta stratus in medium levels. That then becomes, uh, sorry, so alta cumulus at medium levels, which then becomes alto stratus and it's from this cloud that the first of the rain of the front actually falls. Now it's important to be aware of the rain that's falling from a warm front because even if it's not reaching the surface and let's say you're flying at uh, I don't know what 4,000 feet your rain airframe may actually be cold particularly in conditions such as we've got at the moment so your airframe is going to be cold. Of course you're putting that cold airframe through a damp atmosphere as the rain is falling. And that means that the aircraft is far more prone to airframe icing as the rain hits. So it's something to be aware of, uh, particularly at this time of year. Now, as the front passes, the cloud base will lower and the rain becomes more persistent and falls from nimbo stratus cloud. Now, this is the cloud that Joe was mentioning before because it's a thick rain bearing cloud and that brings an extensive risk of icing. If you look at the depth of that cloud, very often you'll see it at sort of 12,000 feet uh, close to and along the warm front. 
not only that, it'll reduce visibility below it. And you really don't want to be flying in those areas. And we've all seen it as a warm front comes through, the rain gets more persistent and it goes considerably darker. That's because of the depth of that NIMBO stratus cloud. Now, when the, once the warm front's gone through, temperatures are going to lift and we're going to go into low stratus cloud and drizzle. And of course, Joe mentioned uh, the stratus cloud. Visibility is reduced further, often behind the warm front, and there's often coastal and hill fog. Now, that bit between the warm front and the cold front is what we call the warm sector. It's like a wedge of warm air, and that's the tropical maritime air mass. So you see how it all suddenly starts to fit together. Now, as forecasters, we visualise these things. We visualise the air masses and we visualise the weather that's associated with fronts. And I'd encourage you as pilots as well to, to start trying to visualise what the weather is going to be. I mean, it's all right for us as forecasters to give you a TAF or a 215 or a gamut, you know, or whatever forecast it might be. But actually, it's really helpful for you to have that visualisation in your mind as well as to what the weather's going to look like around these fronts. So let's talk now about cold fronts. And um, the cold front is generally behind the warm front. It travels faster than the warm front on most occasions and catches up with it, bringing in a narrower band of heavy rain. And the cold front is symbolised on the weather map by blue triangles or by solid black triangles on the black and white maps. And when a cold front's approaching, the winds will become gustier, the rain will become heavier, and on the front itself, there's a risk of hail, of thunder, and of lightning as well. And you'll notice the Q and H falling as well, just ahead of the front, and then it will quickly rise behind it. Now, cold fronts are fascinating because they're just a wedge of dense, warm air that's kind of bulldo bulldozing its way through the warmer air ahead of it and forcing it to rise. And it's this that generates the deep cloud that, um, <clears throat> that gives us rise to the, uh, to the thunder and lightning, the, the embedded cumulonimbus and cumulus that can often be along that front. Um, I remember a couple of years ago approaching uh, New York JFK on a commercial airline and um, we went through an, a very active winter cold front and there was lightning, there was snow, there was severe turbulence. There was just about everything from on well, from about 8,000 feet right the way through to the final stages of landing. And I think I was probably the only person on the plane not screaming, but looking out the window and saying how excellent it was. You can imagine how often I got sworn at by uh, my wife and children. Um, so, yeah, cold fronts um, will bring us that narrow band of heavy rain. But again, as GA pilots, we want to avoid them, don't fly through them. Once the cold front has passed, then uh, we'll get into an hour or two of quieter weather before showers arrive. And then finally, let's just look at uh, occluded fronts. And when the cold front catches up with the warm front, then we get an occluded front. And they're symbolized by the purple alternating semicircles and triangles that we see on the weather map. Um, I generally think with the occluded front as having sort of rain ahead and behind it, but with the risk of some embedded cumulus and cumulonimbus clouds, pretty similar to that of uh, a cold front. And an occlusion can usually be found around mature areas of low pressure. So that means that they've gone through their major development stage. And uh, Really, an occlusion could be thought of as having similar characteristics to a, a warm and a cold front. Now, really important to remember that no two fronts are ever the same. What I'm describing to you here is the idealised situation, the model front. Very rarely do we see those. Each front is different. And I can guarantee if you presented 10 forecasters with exactly the same information, you would come up with 10 very slightly different frontal charts because everybody draws them on in slightly different places. They'll be very similar, but forecasters will draw them on very, very uh, slightly different to each other. So just something to bear in mind that those fronts are uh, never exactly the same. And as forecasters, we identify them very slightly differently as well. But don't let that confuse you as pilots. 
So by remembering the cloud types that Joe and I have spoken about, the air masses and the fronts associated with them, you should have a better appreciation of which clouds are friendly for flying and also uh, which of the clouds you should avoid or uh, the ones that should should keep us on the ground. I must admit, I've, I've been at the airfield on more than one occasion, seen very large cumulonimbus clouds around us and watch people take off. And, you know, obviously they, they get to where they've got to go safely. As a forecaster, though, I look at it sometimes and think, oh, you really are taking quite a risk there. So just treat these clouds cautiously, get to know them, get to identify them and treat them, particularly the cumulonimbus clouds and the nimbostratus cloud with kid gloves. OK, so finally, finally from me, um, let's have a look at um, 215 and the uh, gamuts. And these are probably one of the best places to see a daily mention of cloud types. Um, you'll see them on both 215 on and on the gamuts. And you'll see the cloud types mentioned you'll see cloud heights mentioned in the forecasts, um, but very often people kind of ignore, ignore them or, or move away from them because there's a lot of abbreviations there. It takes a short time to sort of deconstruct what they're saying, but trust me, perseverance is key, particularly with 215. There's a, a download of abbreviations actually at the bottom of the Met Office aviation web pages. So if you scroll down, click on abbreviations, you'll see a breakdown for the abbreviations that you can see on form 215. And you'll see the cloud types that, that Joe's been talking about on there. And, and also Gamet, just putting out an appeal about Gamet. This is a much underused resource that's um, available to us as pilots. And I very often think of this one as a use it or lose it, because obviously, this is being paid for and if it's not used why would people be paying paying for it so if it's free to us as pilots so we should make use of it it's and, and joe can probably add more to this it's one of the only outlets that a human forecaster can have proper input into describing to us as pilots what the weather is likely to do so if you haven't used gamut yet go and have a look at the met office website and uh, and, and and see what you think and if you're unsure about form 215 um, if you go to the Weather School YouTube channel and do a search, I did a webinar on 215. And of course, go and have a look at the previous Astral Aviation Consulting um, sessions that we've done together because we talk about 215 on that as well. OK, right. I've spoken enough to you. No doubt you're fed up in my voice. So stay on cloud nine. Yeah, it's just a weatherman's joke because that's actually the code of cumulonimbus clouds that we meteorologists use. So we find that hilarious. Stay with me. I'm here all night, folks. Um, OK, and with that, I'm going to hand you over to Matt. Matt. Uh, brilliant. Uh, thanks very much. Um, when I was sweating and stressing over my ATPL Met exams at Oxford in some classroom and that and trying to do those exams, why didn't I have Joe and Simon explaining it to me like that? It would have been would have been so much better. But but there we are. So, yeah, brilliant explanations. To pilots. Um, so what? So, um, you know, what, what does all this mean to us as GA pilots, instructors, examiners, students, interested parties that we've got on the calls today? Well, let's kind of lead this off with a, another poll, please. So we're going to put the next poll up. I'm going to read some of this out because it's a bit uh, longer there as well. You arrive at the airfield and check the weather for a morning flight. And we've got a TAF here. So there we go, between 9 and 1500, we've got a bit of wind there. All the nines, few, three, five, and then a prob 30 tempo between 9 and 12, 7,000 metres, shower rain, scattered 1400, and then a prob 30 between 9 and 1500, another 7,000 metres, shower rain, scattered 1700 CB. So what's your analysis of the situation? Here we go. We've got a few answers here. It's a nice day. It's very low chance of a few showers. Or are you thinking it should be quite flyable, but I need to keep an eye on things? Or are you thinking I'm not going to go as far as I think because I could get caught out? Or are you thinking there's a risk of some really bad weather today? I'm going to stay in the crew room drinking coffee, 
in the tea bar uh, with with my friends. Um, so what do you think? There is no legal answer to this. This is not a question about regulations or what the CA tell you what to do. We're just interested in thoughts and feelings on this as well. So there you go. We've got four answers. Hopefully everybody's had a chance to have a look at those now. Thank you. Let's have a look at the results and see what we've got. Okay, so interestingly, we have a bit of a mix. Yeah, so there's some people are saying, yeah, I think we should uh, do some flying with the ET9 things. Some people are saying, I'm not going to feel as far as I think. And some people say, you know what, I'm going to take that coffee and tea and cake in the cafe. Well, nobody's right, nobody's wrong. And really, I think what we were trying to get across to this question is the correct answer is whatever's correct for you on the day. It's going to be very variable on your experience, what capabilities you've got, what aircraft you've got to do. And, you know, it is great and fascinating. It's actually great, I think, to see that split in the answers across those, because that means everybody's taking that analysis, taking what it means to them for their experience and their capabilities. So, you know, one of the things to take away from this is that, uh, you know, the forecast, the weather, the situation may mean different impacts and different challenges to different people, depending on their experience, skills and the aircraft in there as well. OK, let's move on from that. Thank you. So what? Um, so like I say, um, you know, we've talked about cloud types, fronts, air masses. You know, what, what does all of this mean to us as a pilot? Well, what I'm going to suggest to you is the takeaway is all about what's happening with the lower level clouds and how they can affect your flight here. Now, I know there'll be some of you on this presentation that are thinking, ah, oh, no, no, Matt, you, you're thinking just of GA VFR pilots that are trying to stay clear of cloud all the time. I'm an IFR pilot. I've got a very capable aircraft. Of the, uh, well, yes, I understand that. We understand that. But I would contend you're still interested in those lower level clouds. What about the CB risk? What about the icing risk? What about the turbulence risk? Is your flight going to be comfortable and capable for the passengers and the people that you're trying to do? Have you got the instrument approaches, the diversions? So it's that lower level cloud, probably up to about our oh, 10, 12,000 foot mark, that's really, really going to be the effect for the GA pilots. For those of you but our GA VFR pilots predominantly, uh, we can really commend the new CA safety sense leaflet number five, uh, which is flight under VFR. Uh, the team have just put that in the chat box there. It's, it's a really good read and there's some really good, nice, clearly presented advice in there as well. And what that advice um, suggests and what we suggest is that you really determine the cloud base and visibility is suitable for intended flight. And the safe minimum is going to depend on a lot of factors and terrain, obstacle elevation on your route is going to be a big part of that as well. Um, the, the, uh, the link doesn't recommend that flight below 1500 foot AGL is recommended. And it's, since that's going to make visual navigation quite challenging. And also you're going to get low flying aircraft like the military uh, down there as well. So, it's all about reducing terrain clearance at that lower levels and increasing the risk of obstacles such as mast. So, you know, we want to be thinking in that 1500 to kind of cloud base uh, thing. Um, as a result of poor weather and low cloud, there's been a number of inadvertent entry to IMC situations as well. And sadly, some very nasty accidents there as well. And this is where pilots have unfortunately flown into the ground under control below safety altitude or below a safe altitude for where they are as well. Now, we've done a number of webinars on this with a load of res, uh, resources around this as well, uh, all about avoiding inadvertent entry to IMC. And Chloe's going to put the links in the chat box to some of those workshops and videos that you can watch uh, there as well. Okay. Um, I saw a few comments popping up as I was chatting about the link to that safety sense leaflet as well. So I know the team will check that. And if there's any problems with that, we will uh, we will update it in the chat as we go through as, as well. So uh, bear with us on that as well. Right, if we move on to the next slide then, please. 
So threat and error management, I'm, you'll be glad to know I'm really not going to give you another lecture on threat and error management. We've talked about it. We've done a lot about it. Um, hopefully it will all uh, all work there as as well. Um, that link, I think, is coming through in the chat box as well. So great on that. We'll make sure it goes out in the resources later if it doesn't work for you. So back to threat and error management as well. Hopefully it's a concept that a lot of you have now started to hear about, started to understand, maybe even applying in your flying and your training as well. Well, we can't control the weather. Simon and Joe have very much uh, uh, displayed that and told us how that is. Thing. But what we can do is we can prepare and plan appropriately as well. And what we're all about trying to do is inform ourselves as to whether our intended flight, our intended profile of our flight is, is, is going to be viable or is there threats to it? Are there errors we could make with the weather? And what do we need to do to mitigate that as well? Now, in terms of weather appreciation, Simon's talked about this a lot. This is something I really commend as well. And it's helpful when you're thinking about the weather for your flight to think about big to small. Yep. So first, get an appreciation of the big situation. And this is all about understanding the air masses that are affecting your intended area of routing and also better understanding the types of weather, particularly the cloud types that you're likely to see on any frontal zones that are around that day as well. During your pre-flight prep for this, this is where we recommend you review your current, the 215, the general situation over the UK and in the areas uh, around that are going to uh, affect your flight and the associated weather in those zones as well. Now, secondly, we could then start to focus in on the small and more the localised situation. And this is where we get down into the TAFs, the METARs, you know, your departure airfield, maybe ones on your routes, ones nearby, and perhaps hopefully as well, you might be thinking about, you know, a diversion uh, if your destination is not available or your home airfield is not available for some reason as well. A um, couple of things just to point out with these as well. Remember, of course, that TAF and METAR cloud heights are AAL, above airfield level. It's the bottom of the cloud base in hundreds of feet above the airport where they're published. OK, so remember that. But the 215, when you're looking at those bigger pictures, are AMSL. Yeah, so it's above sea level. So remember to factor in the height of the terrain when you're looking at those big things compared to the small things like the TAFs and the METARs. There is those differences there as well. Now, having appreciation of whether it's going to increase your situational awareness and hopefully, uh, you know, avoid you unexpectedly encountering things that you're not going to um, uh, find. Now, one of the things that can be helpful in this visualisation as well a lot of the apps that are out there as well, some of the flight planning apps now will actually give you a vertical radar. And this is, can be really good at giving you a representation of your cloud height at your intended cruise levels relative to your terrain as well. A lot of the apps as well will actually let you drag your height that you plan to fly at around. So you can actually look at how you might have to adapt that relative to airspace, more for error management there and also the cloud types that you might encounter. But remember, all of this is based on forecasts and observations at the time. OK, so you need to be sure that any of the data that you're using to plan and make your decisions is up to date, it's timely, and you get the best data available. Now, one thing to say on this as well, Simon talks about this loads as well, I know. Um, on your iPhone or your Samsung or whatever you happen to have, you now I can be stood in a field pretty much in the middle of nowhere with an airplane just at a grassy airfield. On that phone, in my hand, I can get so much weather information. I can get apps, I can get updates, uh, everything like that. The only thing to say is just beware of what you're looking at. Know what the information on your apps and on your phone is telling you. Know where it's come from, and know what currencies, what uh, you know, uh, units it's talking about and is in and is giving you there as well. You know, there is some little gotchas. You can even select from winds and things like that. You can select mile and hours and knots and things like this. There's all sorts of settings. A lot of these apps are very, very clever. And, uh, you know, if you uh, will colour code areas of the UK for flying conditions, well, make sure you know what parameters 
that it's set at that you're looking at there as well. So the time to do all of this is playing around on a horrible night like tonight where it's minus three outside with a coffee. That's the time to be playing with your apps and your, your iPad and getting used to it, not at the airfield when you're in a rush trying to get to go flying as well. So hopefully that's just given you a few little thoughts about how we actually apply some of the great information and advice that, uh, that Simon and Joe have given us. Right, Chris, I think it's uh, it's Chris time, isn't it? So remember, Certainly we're not taking, yeah, we're not taking uh, any answers. Uh, this we're not tracking who said what. Um, there's there's no uh, there's no tracking of this and no clever analytics behind this. This is just to see um, whether we've uh, uh, all you know got some value out of what we've been hearing as well. And I'll let you into a secret. Quite often when we're prepping and doing these as well, uh, we always refresh ourselves as well. So it, it comes to everybody here as well. So we've just got a few questions, not too many, um, just a bit of fun at the end. So let's move on to the first one, please, Chris. So question one, and I'll read it out as well, just to give you a bit of time. What's signified by a line of blue triangles on a form 215? Let's have the options. Line of blue triangles on a form 215. So warm front, cold front, occluded front, area of low pressure here as well. You won't get these questions down your local pub this Christmas, I guarantee it. What have we got? You will Let's if we're in the at... pub, Matt. Pardon? You will if we're in the pub. Well, th this is true. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's have a look at the answers. What have people given us? The yeah, correct answer was B. Oh, look at that, 100%. Simon, Joe, uh, your work here is done. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, excellent. Let's move on to the, uh, the second question then, please. Here we go. So this is a bit getting a little bit more A-level. If there's a warm front passing over the British Isles and the wind is from the southwest, so that's down Cornwall Way for those of you struggling with directions. What sort of air mass is likely to be affecting the UK? Warm front passing over the British Isles. Wind is from the southwest. What sort of air mass is likely to be affecting the UK? Here's the choices. Tropical maritime, polar maritime, polar continental or Arctic maritime. I'll give people just a few seconds for those results again. Let's have a look at, uh, at the results again then, please. So A was the intended answer. Look, what results did we get? There we go. Yeah, pretty much there with that. Spot on, people. There we go. Right, let's move on to the third question then, please. So what are the cloud types that most affect GA pilots? Low level clouds, such as Alta Cumulus and Cirrus, medium level clouds, such as Alto Stratus and Nimbo Stratus, high level clouds, such as Cirrus, Cirrus Cumulus and Cirrus Stratus, or low level clouds, such as Stratus, Nimbus Stratus, Cumulus and Cumulonimbus. I've got a few choices there a couple of low levels, a couple of medium level, and some high levels. So let's have a look. What answers have we got? Correct answer we were looking for was D. What did people plump for? There we go. Definitely. Yes. Brilliant. And of course, you know, we talk, we think about low level, medium level and high level, but actually in GA terms, low is quite a broad band, isn't it, as well, really? So it does go up fairly high in terms of our operating altitudes there as well. Okay, a uh, couple more questions just to go, just to finish off with. So uh, here we go. When decoding TAFS metals in the Form 25, it's important to remember that. Remember, I just said this. So 215 heights, what are they in? Is it AMSL, AAL, AGL, or AGL? And TAF metals, are they AGL flight levels? AMSL or AAL. So what combination have you got here as well? There we go. And the box will pop up there as well. Just to explain 
because we've got a lot of people on tonight as well. Um, the reason we have the slides and the box popping up as well is that people watching this video on the YouTube playback obviously won't have the box popping up. So that's why we have both of these things popping up so people can watch it on playback for those that are new to us tonight. Okay, let's have a look at the answer. What did we get? Answer D was what we were looking for, of course. Oh, we've got a bit of difference there, haven't we? So two and five for AMSL. Tough metals heights are all in AGL. That's right. Yep. 81% there as well. Brilliant. Okay, let's have a look. I think we've got a slight error there, Chris, actually, haven't we? In the highlighted we question. I think we've we've tripped ourselves up there. So, um, Simon, the correct answer, of course, is A, isn't it? And Joe, two on fives are AMSL and tough meta heights are airfield above AAL. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, there we go. Astral on the naughty step for that one. We've mixed up some, some answers there as well. <laughs> Yeah, but none of us spotted it. <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> really, I was always taught as an instructor, if your demonstration or your teach goes wrong, don't try and wing it. Just admit it and be honest about <laughs> yeah, it. Right. So there we go. I'm following my, my older flying instructor examiner's advice there as well. Right. Last, last question. It's probably a good idea. It's the last one. <laughs> we were probably too far down the mince pies when we did the prep. There we go. What does plus TSRA broken 050 CB mean in a TAF or a METAR? So what are we getting? Heavy thunderstorms and rain, broken cloud. There's a hub. Let people read through these as well, because and this is a takeaway with TAFs and METARs as well. Sometimes you do have to slow down a little bit and just pick out the elements of it to think, yeah, that means that, that means that, and put it all together into what we uh, what we get. Right, what answers have we got for that one, please? Heavy thunderstorms rain, broken cloud at 5,000 feet. There we go, 63%. Great stuff. So, there we go, brilliant. Hopefully that just put some of the things into practice for you that Joe and Simon had talked about there as well. And it just shows that uh, we need to do some checking of these things. There we go. It depends. Not obvious, is it? It's easy to trip yourselves up. <laughs> brilliant. Over to Q&A. Great. Thanks, Matt. Lovely job. Right. Um, over to you guys for Q&A. We've got loads of questions in the Q&A box, which is brilliant. So I'm going to start firing them out left, right, and Chelsea. Um, we've got about 20-odd minutes left until um, the end of this session, so plenty of time. Let's go for it. So I'll start at the top. This one's from Tony. This one's for Simon. Simon, can you clarify? I think recently you referred to AirMets in a recent article. Is that the same as Gamet? Uh, no, my Tony. Um, no, it's not. The the gamuts replace the emets. So uh, emets are what we used to see, which were regionalised and then broken down further into into different areas. Actually, I loved emets and kept pushing them, but very few pilots uh, use them. So they were replaced with the the gamuts, which I think cover uh, is it three areas or four areas, Joe. I can't remember. Is it three three areas, isn't it? Four. Uh, is it four? Yeah. Okay. So, so they cover um, four areas, but. As I say, for that they're difficult to read at first, and they—I have to say—they're not in the most friendly format. It's all capital letters, um, so you do have to persevere a little bit with them. But the information within them is really, really useful. Um, so I would say, and and Matt made this point, you know, on a dark, cold night like this, that's the time to start reading through them to get used to the information that they're putting across and remember that these are produced by human forecasters so this is the gold standard 
of uh, a forecasting map mentioned apps um, where we can basically look at any app we want and eventually we'll see the weather that we want to see uh, won't we but when we're looking at something like gamets and, and taps fall into the same sort of category as well um, and two one and two one five um, that's the gold standard so yeah um, a gamut different to airmets similar sort of information um persevere with it read through it get used to using them the beauty with them i find as well actually is that you get an outlook on the gamut as well so say for if we were looking at it in the morning so if you're in the office and perhaps you look at it at 10 o'clock in the morning you do get an outlook as well uh on there so it goes further ahead so it's really really useful i i, I do use them you know and i'm i'm forecasting myself but as forecasters we're always looking at what everybody else is doing anyway and what everybody else is thinking. So, yeah, I, I use them, but but certainly do get used to using them. Can I I was just going to add in there as well that the um, the F215 is quite as a forecaster. It's, it's quite um, restrictive in what we can put in. So um, the coding that's used, um, even the like lettering and the, the size, like it has to fit on like kind of one A4 page. So it's quite restrictive. But that gives you like that really good big picture overview of what's happening across the whole of the UK. It's got the fronts. Um, someone asked about um, speed of movement. It's got speed of movement of the fronts are on there, always indicated as well. Um, and then I would say then your gamut is where you can kind of deep dive into your kind of more specific detail for the area that you're interested in and that there's more flexibility for the forecaster within the gamut to actually write the the weather conditions for the day um, and it kind of explained the changes although there's still some restrictions on what we can and can't put in and the language we use there's still a lot more scope to be um yeah, a bit clearer, I think, within the gamut. And as Simon said, it also has like the outlook on there as well, which all of that will have forecaster input into it. And generally, um, uh, the northern region one is written uh, by the forecasters in Aberdeen. Um, the central and southwestern one are written from forecasters in Exeter. And then the um, there's another one, uh, a southeastern one, um, and that's actually written by the forecaster at Heathrow. So the forecaster at Heathrow for the southeast will obviously have quite a good idea of what's going on there as well. So you're generally looking, they're written by the forecasters who are actually looking at that area of weather. They're writing the TAFs as well. So um, they've got a really good understanding of what's going on. Lovely. Thanks, Joe. Do you want to add anything more on gamuts? I know you would, uh, Simon mentioned them earlier, and we'd obviously had that discussion prior to um webinar this evening but since we've got you both here do you want to add anything more on that i know there's been a few questions about its utility and there's a number of people said in the chat box that never even heard of it before mm. yeah i think and i think um you know as someone rightly asked about you know the difference between Airbet and gamut it, it was a change of name that there's a few slight differences in terms of format um uh, and, and i think that has added to confusion but generally i think as forecasters we get the impression that people just don't really look at gamuts or haven't really kind of used them and I would just really encourage people to use them in terms of in terms of effort from a forecaster there's a lot of effort put into a gamut it takes they take quite <laughs> they're a real pain to write they take quite a long time to write and um these days you know as the world progresses a lot of um forecast products are becoming more automated but the gamut isn't one of them has some automation some of the winds and things are automated and put into those so we don't have to worry about that side of it too much bar a kind of visual check but the actual forecast that's that's a person sat there doing that and you know working that out as to what's going on so um you know i would say look at the 215 as an overview and then you know to get a deeper understanding of what's happening in your area your the gamut should complement the, the 215 okay um, and just picking up on a question, a question from Paddy, do you know how often the gamuts are produced? Yeah, they're four times a day, actually. So they're, um, they, and they do kind of overlap. So, for example, the one that's issued at four o'clock in the morning covers a period from uh, 0800 to 17. And then there's another one issued at 10, and that covers the period from 1400 to 23. So there's a little bit of overlap on there. So, you know, they're, they're, they should be regularly spaced enough that you'll be getting, you know, any changes that have occurred within the forecast story will be reflected within the gamut. Okay. But Great, yeah, it's four times you. a day, four, 10, 16, and 22. 
Perfect. Lovely stuff. Just, Thank you. Can I just jump in there, Matt? Just uh, the, Chris, just quick. Um, mm. Just to follow on from what Joe was saying, where she says that, yeah, you know, they're a bit of a pain for, for, for the forecasters to write. That's because there is so much information in there. Mm. And then we as pilots for GA look at it and it's a bit of a pain to read. Yes. Actually, yeah. Actually, what we have to make sure is that as pilots, we're not just going down the easy, quick answer route because that's the route of automated forecasts of stuff coming straight out of, out of a model and directly onto onto your phone sometimes and and you know this is not me being condescending at all but sometimes we've got to work at it a little bit ourselves and have a responsibility to us when we're flying to actually put the effort in to read the information that is there and it's not being gone into detail uh, because the forecaster gets paid per word it's gone into that much detail because there is that much of a story to tell so I think that we have a responsibility as well to to put the effort in to to read those forecasts that are um, that are being produced and like you say I think you know Met Office probably has to take some blame because it wasn't particularly well publicized what the gamut is and how it can be used and that's why events like this are so useful to say it's there let's get let's get using it yeah, good point. Thank you. OK, this next question is from Julian. Um, probably if you want for you, Simon, please. How would you distinguish a vigorous front from a feeble one? <laughs> question. <laughs> good question. Damn angry. <laughs> there you um, go. Yeah, it's um, I, I, I kind of talk about fronts as being active and not as active. And by an active front, what I mean is that it conforms to the textbook idea of what that particular front should be. So if it's a warm front, generally you're going to get moderate rain on a warm front. Uh, cold fronts tend to be moderate to heavy rain. And, and that's what I would term as a as a, as a standard uh, active front. Obviously, the heavier the rain on them, the more the more active the front is. By a, a, a less active front, I mean, just like rain on there. You could still get low cloud. You could still get hazards that apply to us uh, when we're flying. Um, but yeah, that's what I tend to think of as a as a vigorous front. And it might be that it's associated with a deeper area of low pressure. So perhaps, you know, 970 millibars or something like that. Uh, hectopascal, sorry. Going back. <laughs> uh, not, I get told off all the time by my students for calling it millibars still. Oh, must get out of the habit. So, you know, it, the, the, the deeper the low you tend to find the more active the fronts, the heavier the rain, et cetera, that are, that are around them. So that's that's what I visualise. I can't put numbers on it, but that's what I visualise as a, as a more vigorous, a more, a more active front. Okay, great. Thank you. And I, I was just going to add to that as well. I'll just say that I think... I think you're right, Simon. I think, you know, we, we tend to talk about kind of active and, and sort of not so active fronts. And there's a lot of <laughs> physics and stuff that goes into that in terms of the amount of energy that's contained within a front. Um, but I think from a practical perspective, um, uh, one thing I would say is not not to use, um, you know, one chart or one product just in isolation, but to kind of look at look at them uh, as a kind of a whole, as a big picture. And, and that it does take some time to kind of get your head around doing that. And it is kind of practice to do that. But, you know, have a look at your F215, see where those fronts are kind of are on that 215, then get hold of a radar picture. There's, you know, loads of apps have radar pictures these days. And, you know, Met Office, when there's all sorts out there that do. But have a look at a radar picture. Can you see those really bright spots on the radar? You know, those kind of pinks and, and um, yellows and things that in that and that will indicate that kind of stronger, heavier rain um, and will help you to show if there's a kind of active front. Equally, if it's a bit patchy and there's, bit, you know, little bits of blue on there, then it could be that it's weaker. And the only thing caveat there is just to be aware that not all drizzle doesn't always show up very well on a radar, but um, that, that, you know, is quite a good indication of whether something is a bit more active or not is, um, and, you know, don't look at things in isolation, kind of try and get a, an overall picture. And, uh, and I think as well there, Joe. again, sorry, just to, 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 to jump in, and this kind of goes off topic a little bit, is that it's, it's, it's important as well that when we talk about MET and we're talking about weather, and I say this to MET um, students, whether they're in the PPL or whether they're in their ATPL, it's important to remember that we're dealing with weather. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those few topics, I suppose human performance is a little bit similar, but one of those few topics in, um, in GA where actually it's quite fuzzy, it's quite blurred, and we are effectively predicting the future, we're predicting <laughs> chaos, and 
you know, there are times when we as forecasters, and I don't want to destroy your confidence in us at all here, but there are times when we as forecasters um, are also sometimes passengers to the weather. So there are some times when we will look at it and we can't quite get our heads around what's what's happening either. Classic example of it, last weekend with the snow, caught a lot of forecasters out. I know it caught us out in, in the areas that it was. We knew it would occur, but the areas where it was was so super fine as to whether that was going to occur or not, that sometimes we sit, we have to take a step back and look at it as well. And again, I come down to this thing of, of numbers. You know, you can't always put numbers into forecasting. The science is there. We know the physics. We know the way that the atmosphere should work. It's just that sometimes when we think we've got Mother Nature absolutely licked, she turns around and bites us in the bum. <laughs> and just be aware on, on the apps as well. We talked about Rainfall Radar. It comes back to what we were talking about uh, in terms of knowing uh, what the app is giving you, uh, a lot of the rainfall radars and the presentations can actually have a lag in them as well. Sometimes it can be a 15 minute update on some of the apps out there as well. And actually, in terms of in a very convective day, um, a lot can happen in 15 minutes. Potentially, there can be quite a lot of movement. So just be aware of what, what it's giving you there as well. Also, some of the apps and the new Met Office one is very good. It's been updated now and I'm not uh, on commission from the Met Office, but it will give you the rainfall radar or give you the actual rainfall radar. And then it also shows the predicted radar uh, forecast going ahead for the rainfall uh, the tracks as well. But bear in mind, it is obviously switching from an actual situation to a forecast situation. So just bear that in mind when you're sliding around and looking at it as well. Good stuff, thanks. Right, this is a question for Matt um, from Daniel. Uh, pilots are often expected to judge distance from cloud. Um, as an example, over 3,000 feet ASL on VFR, we might be expected to judge horizontal 1,500 meters and vertical distances, for example, 1,000 feet. What do you have, what are good ways, what, what good rules of thumb do you use to estimate such distances, Matt? So I think all you can do is best efforts, if I'm honest. You, you can you, all you, you try and use your judgment in best efforts. But if you know from the forecasts what kind of range you're expecting the cloud bases and visibility to be at, and then you apply what you were kind of expecting to see to what you're experiencing when you're airborne, you know, you shouldn't be a, a, a million miles away, really. If the, the forecasters were predicting cloud bases of 3,000 feet and you're up at, you know, two and a bit and you're seeing it above, you can probably know that it's a fairly good forecast there as well. The thing to really watch out for, of course, is lower cloud that forms uh, unexpectedly and you've got to be careful if you're operating in and around holes in cloud as well so if you're a vfr pilot you don't have imc capabilities you're using a hole or you're operating on top of a cloud layer a bit like the picture uh, in my background here and you're relying on holes to to get your way down or whatever you need to really monitor those as well to make sure that they don't they don't close up on you as well but i think in terms of judging distances it's applying what you expected from the forecast to what you're experiencing and really making best efforts there as well just a little publicity thing here for the take two as well in terms of take two distance take two uh, laterally uh, from airspace there as well when planning so don't try and find yourself hemmed in by cloud and airspace as well, because that's when uh, with those two things together, because that's when things are going to get very challenging for you airborne and you might risk infringement or inadvertent IMC or worst case, both. Thanks. Thank you. Um, OK, this is going to be an interesting forecaster debate. This one. What is the difference between Prob 30 and Prob 40 on a TAF? Here we go. So Two glad you forecasters. Asked that. <laughs> 10 the pub then, Joe. Here we go. go. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that. Um, so I did. Someone, a couple of people asked a question actually, and I responded to one of them. But um, effectively, it's the probability of um, 
an occurrence of something within the TAF cha changing, an element changing, whether it be that cloud high visibility, could be you know both elements changing. And so then the, the 30 or the 40 is the percentage chance of that happening. Um, so you know, prob 30 is effectively a 30% probability that something will happen, this particular element will change and become this temporarily. Um, someone asked a question in there as well about you know why why is it 30 and 40 and why aren't there other ones um so some of all of that is detect dictated by ICAO and so the actual <laughs> if you really want to know all the like ins and outs the detail is contained within ICAO annex three um so again it's um, a set rule that we have to adhere to um as part of the international standard and um if you <laughs> in simple terms if you're, if you're up to a 50% probability, then you kind of need to come off the fence and plump one way or the other. Either, you know, you're 50% and over the fence and therefore it's going to happen. And so you would uh, aim to use something like a becoming within your TAF. So, you know, it's definitely going to happen. Um, and if it's less than 50%, then you use your 30 or 40. If it's less than a 30% chance, then it doesn't need to be in the TAF. Um, you know, you kind of, you have to, that's when you'd be questioning yourself. You, you get to that point as a forecaster where you think um you know i'm going to put it in as a prop 30 like how much do i think this is going to happen do do i want to put that in um is it really a 30 percent, or actually am i just hedging my bets um so <laughs> it's all about coming off the fence one way or the other good good answer would you agree with that simon or is there more debate to be had? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I agree with the answer gave some mo given some moments ago, Malud. Um, there we go. We've now got I mean, two forecasters look, agreeing on one yeah, thing. Yeah, it's, it's the perennial question, isn't it? You know, and 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 again, I'd, I'd say to pilots, don't get hung up by it. Basically, forty percent of prob forty is more likely to happen than a prob thirty, and that's all you need to know. Yeah. And also, just think, okay. There we are at the airfield. And remember that the TAF is valid. Joe, is it for the airfield or is it for a distance around the airfield? I can't remember it's what the actual It's is. for the aerodrome itself. It's for the air, it's, so it's for the ATZ, isn't it? Around yeah. the in within the within the aerodrome. Right. Yeah. So there we are in our little aircraft. And you've got a prob 30 of a shower. Okay. So 30% chance of a shower occurring, let's say. And then we take off in our aircraft and we go and fly around within. 50 100 nautical miles whatever it might be of the air of the of the aerodrome so actually we've just increased that probability anyway because we've stuck our aircraft out into the region as where this weather might be coming from so we've increased the risk anyway so don't don't get too hung up by it and the, the other one that i've seen as well and i have this mentioned to me regularly is that all oh, the um the uh the the, the my, my instructor says to me that if it's a prob 30 it probably won't happen. If it's a prob 40, it probably will. I think that's just complete rubbish. And it's one of these things that's got into the psyche of instructors. Um, th that just isn't that just isn't the case. OK, so there you are. That's that. That's what I think about it. But again, I, I defer to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Wise. Right. Um, that brings us to the end of Q&A. There's a whole bunch of questions that are still um, yet to be answered. A lot of the answers to these are in our previous MET webinars, actually. So if you've got the time, then please do check back through our website and have a look at those, uh, the recordings of those and, whole, Matt, and all Matt, the can, resources that were there. Matt, can I just jump in very quickly? I see the Sky Demon questions coming in. And this is something that I'm getting asked more and more and more at Weather School about is Sky Demon weather and the information that's on there. So very briefly, metals and TAFs on Sky Demon, exactly the same as you're going to see elsewhere. They're going to be up to date. OK, the flyable weather conditions on Sky Demon is just a forecast so it's a forecast it's updated rapidly but it's a forecast for i think the next two hours do not use that for go no go decisions okay sky demon don't want you to use it for that reason anyway so do not use that information for go no go decisions so if you suddenly see a little hole on those flyable conditions charts you don't use them to give you the answer that oh i can go flying you use metals and taps for that OK, so I just wanted to get that in there. About That's good. Yeah, thank you. Some sage advice there. And like I say, there's a whole bunch of um, these questions that have already been answered in our previous webinars. So uh, by Simon, 
um, and some of the other resources as well. So please do take a look at those. Speaking of resources, I'll pop this slide on the screen, um, which is the Met Office Aviation Briefing Service. If you haven't signed up to that already, then please do so. There's a whole bunch of useful stuff on there, which you can see on the right-hand side there, such as METAR D codes, TAF D codes, 215s, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you don't have that, I, was, I would thoroughly recommend it. It is very good. And as Simon says before about the likes of Gamma, et cetera, a lot of this is use it or lose it. So please, please do do that. Uh, look at that. It's a good service and some good stuff in there. Right then, just finishing up now, a little bit of an advert for Simon's next weather school, as you can see on the screen, 7th of January, 2023. What a, what a, what a great Christmas present. I know, look at that. What's not to like? So go to his website, sign up. Lots of people saying they love the weather. Go and talk to Simon more about it. He loves it. <laughs> well, then and then finally let's have a look at some contact details please do contact us if you need to uh, please go to the websites there's a whole bunch of resources on there which i've already mentioned you can scan the qr code on the screen now which will give you links to everything if you so desire this replay with a load of other links to other resources will be made available to you uh, once we finish this and of course as as normal a poll will pop up so please do give us the feedback based on this but the final thing the second final thing i need to do is announce the competition winner clearly who were on bated breath drum roll please michael catania we'll be in touch with you after this michael well done oh, round of nice. applause to michael 250 pounds worth of weather school vouchers coming your way and then last but not least i'd like to say a big thank you to the panel i'd like to say thank you to simon matt and joe great debate great information we've skimmed through so much tonight um so if you want to hear about it in more in any depth then please do get in touch uh, predominantly with simon and you can obviously uh, contact us but a good as i keep saying plugging them at what the uh, uh the mess office that's a really the best place to start so thanks ever so much to the panelists see you all again soon and i hope to see all the audience again soon too happy christmas happy, happy christmas, christmas. Everybody. have happy a great christmas, break everyone, everyone. Thank you.